Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us on our Zebra Muscle webinar. I am Mark Howarth. I'm the Executive Director of the Candlewood Lake Authority. And in a second, I will introduce uh, Neil, uh, who's going to give the presentation. Um, but just to let you all know, we do have everybody muted uh, to keep background uh, noise quiet. Um, if you would like to ask uh, a question, please do so in the chat. And once Neil has finished with his presentation, he will answer as many of those questions uh, as he can. Uh, and um, I guess without further ado, I will let me I let a few more in here, Neil. Um, I will introduce Neil. Oh. You keep getting muted, Neil. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, um, all right. Awesome. Like Andrew, you know, Neil Stalter, our director of ecology. So go ahead, Neil. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you, Mark. Um, and let me just grab this. Okay. And awesome. Well, thanks everyone um, for joining us. Good evening. Um, my name is Neil Stalter. Uh, I'm the director of ecology for the Lake Authority. Um, tonight, I'm going to be presenting some information on our uh, new neighbors, uh, as I like to call them, the zebra mussels. Um, and some of their possible impacts um, and how we can begin, you know, managing them at home. Um, and for anyone curious, this presentation will also be available via our YouTube channel tomorrow. So this is being recorded so we can post it to YouTube for those folks that uh, weren't able to join live. Um, so just to quickly um, go over the agenda for the evening, um, we're gonna touch briefly at the beginning here on the current status um, we'll go into some of the possible impacts of zebra mussels um, here on Candlewood. Um, following that, I'm going to talk uh, about some tips on how you can best manage them uh, and their impacts at home. Um, a reminder to make sure that we don't spread our zebra mussels uh, here in Candlewood anywhere else. And then sort of finally a key takeaway and headline um, about how they'll become part of the ecosystem. So all of that should take about 20, 25 minutes, and we'll leave uh, 20 minutes for questions um, at the end, and we'll wrap up by 7.40, 7 7.45. Um, so before we get into it, I just wanted to start off the presentation with a, a bit of a headline um, takeaway. Um, so the CLA and a lot of organizations have spent a lot of time saying that we don't want zebra mussels um, in the lake, and for good reason, um, they can definitely be a nuisance, um, but now that they've arrived, naturally people are very concerned, of course. And so while this species can certainly be a, a headache, um, sometimes Canada Lake isn't going anywhere. Um, it's going to remain the beautiful lake we love to swim, boat, and fish in every summer, and that's not going to change. Um, so as we go over some of their potential impacts, I just want you to keep this idea in mind that while this isn't necessarily what we wanted, the lake is going to be okay. Um, you know, I grew up in the Finger Lakes on a lake that had zebra mussels my whole life until I moved out here to, to Candlewood. Um, and sometimes they were annoying, but that didn't change how much I was able to boat on and enjoy the lake whenever I wanted. Um, so just something to keep in mind as we go forward here. So before we get into the impacts, let's just do a quick uh, history on their arrival here at Candlewood. So the first mussel was found in 2020 um, at the tip of Vaughn's neck in the lake. Um, over the next two years, the population kind of slowly grew each year. Um, there was 600 total found across the whole lake by the spring of last year, so 2023, after that drawdown. Um, that year also included the discovery that they were growing below the depth of the deepest possible drawdown. Um, as well as a chemical indication that they were in fact uh, reproducing. Um, and then this year during the drawdown, um, we found that the population has expanded significantly and they've hit that uh, exponential growth curve, which basically means that now there are too many to count um, and they are a self-sustaining um, population. Um, so that's kind of the history um, but let's talk about some of the impacts because I know, you know, that's probably what most folks are curious about. Um, before I get into the specifics, I just want to express that, you know, every ecosystem is different. So it's pretty likely we'll see some or all of these impacts, 
but we can't be completely certain, um, you know, the extent of them until the population grows enough that it can really start to, to show those impacts. Um, but there's three main areas um, that zebra mussels impact, and the first is ecological. So zebra mussels are really, really efficient at filter feeding algae in the water. Um, and this actually will often increase water clarity um, significantly in lakes. So that's kind of maybe one bit of, of good news is there's a high chance that water clarity will increase. Um, but unfortunately, this can negatively impact the food web. So all those organisms that eat the algae instead of the zebra mussels now all of a sudden have competition. Um, and so that can impact uh, populations like zooplankton. Um, and then those plankton are the food to some species of fish. And you can kind of see the, the, the way that the food web can change in the ecosystem. Um, so that's one of their primary impacts. The other thing to note is that unfortunately, while they like algae, they don't like blue-green algae. So unfortunately, that means the blue-green algae may have a bit of an advantage now because the green algae that they were kind of competing with for nutrients all of a sudden is getting eaten by the zebra mussels a little more often. Um, so that may perhaps uh, help blue-green algae blooms um, in the summertime, um, but the extent of that is not necessarily uh, consistent lake to lake. Some lakes see it, some lakes don't, so it really depends on the ecosystem, but that is a possible one. Um, the increased clarity can also actually mean that aquatic plants in lakes can grow to deeper depths. So in Candlewood, that would probably be the milfoil. That's obviously not something we're going to see right away, um, but it could have a future impact once the plant community recovers. So that will remain to be seen. Um, zebra mussels also uh, obviously have recreational impacts too. So they like to attach to hard surfaces. Um, they can grow on boat intakes, hulls, docks, shoreline rocks, all of those things. Um, and they actually have sharp shells. Um, so they can be uncomfortable. They can cause cuts if they're stepped on. Um, so we'll get into some of the tips on preventing the, those impacts in, in a couple of slides. But those are um, two things. Um, also, now that they are here, um, everyone has to take additional precautions if their boat is ever leaving Candlewood Lake to make sure that zebra mussels aren't being spread. So that's obviously another recreational impact too, is we don't want to spread the zebra mussels um, anywhere else. Um, and then finally, they can have some economic impacts. Um, so they're attaching onto hard surfaces, like I mentioned, that could negatively impact um, boats, docks, and other property. The primary concern for boats, like I mentioned in the recreational section, is that boat intake question. We'll talk a little bit more about that soon. Um, but uh, they do like to grab onto um, any hard surface. So that includes your docks, anything like that. Um, they also could potentially cause some headaches for first light um, by growing on the inside of some of their smaller pipes and equipment. Um, so that will be something for them to consider. Um, and they will also force everyone to sort of spend a little bit more time uh, maintaining all of their um, property once they're removed from the lake in the winter time. So once you take your docks out, your boat out, that sort of thing, um, it'll take a little bit more time to clear off any zebra mussels that may have attached over the course uh, of the year. And that's whether we're a marina, a dock service, or, or a home, homeowner. So those are the, the primary concerns right there on, on this uh, slide. So if you ever um, are wondering, you can always go back to the YouTube video and take a look at this. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what the population change could look like uh, over the course of an invasion of zebra mussels. Um, so usually what is seen is after an initial invasion is there's an initial spike. Um, so that's kind of where we are now. We're at about the middle of an initial spike in population size. Um, eventually, the population will reach a level where there are just too many zebra mussels, and they'll actually start to compete with each other for resources. And then following that point, the population is going to decline pretty quickly over the course of one or two years. And then after that decline, you're going to see a pattern of 
um, recovery followed by decline and then recovery and so forth. And then every cycle generally of this recovery and decline will actually be uh, usually at a lower population density um, as the population begins to reach equilibrium with the ecosystem. So to kind of show that, I actually, uh, this is a graph here from the a estuary in the Hudson River. Um, on the y-axis is the population density of zebra mussels in this estuary. And the three graphs are the size of the zebra mussels. So these are top ones are small, medium, and large mussels. Um, and what is interesting here is that you actually can see this cycle really clearly in this population of mussels. You can see these spikes followed by periods of decline. And in particular, in this large section, you can actually see the uh, population density um, beginning to decrease with every cycle. So um, you can actually look at each of these spikes is a little lower on the y-axis than the one before it with you know some some exceptions and that's the population reaching equilibrium in that estuary in that ecosystem so in canada wood the population size is still pretty moderate so we'll probably see what their peak density looks like in the next couple of years whether it's next year or two years from now that will likely be the peak uh, population density um, okay, so let's talk about what you can do at home to minimize the impacts of zebra mussels. So the first, uh, you know, primary tip is that when you're not using your boat, if it's possible, trim your motor all the way out of the water. I know that if you have an inboard outboard, just an inboard motor, that's not necessarily always possible. Um, if it doesn't come all the way out, it's still good to trim it up as much as you can remove anything from the water while not in use basically that you can so that the zebra mussels just can't have an impact on it so if you're if you have an outboard motor raise it all the way up don't let it sit in the water uh during the summer and allow zebra mussels to to grow um you also could consider a boat hoist if it's feasible for uh you know your shoreline and at your dock um it's also important to note this would come with a first light new activity permit requirement. So if that's something that's uh, realistic for your shoreline, um, you would have to apply for that permit before uh, placing the hoist. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, it's also recommended that if you're going swimming, uh, throw water shoes on. So, you know, I mentioned that uh, zebra mussels are sharp. The water shoes will protect your feet from if you're stepping on a rock that has zebra mussels on it. You know, you, you're not going to be uncomfortable. Those sharp shoes aren't going to cut or the sharp shells aren't going to cut through the shoes um, of a water shoe. So you're totally protected if you throw those on um, and go swimming. Um, generally a good idea uh, anyway. So that's definitely recommended. Um, and then the other thing is it's generally a good idea for maintenance. Um, once you're taking your docks and your supports out for the season, give those a scrape off. Uh, don't let zebra mussels accumulate year over year um, because that's when they can start to get heavy and actually colonize on each other and cause issues. So once a year, when you take it out for the winter, just give it a good scrape off if there's any zebra mussels on there and you should be good to go for the following year. Um, a couple more tips. This first one is one that I think you guys are going to like. Um, use your boat more. So um, as I mentioned before, the primary concern with zebra mussels and boat maintenance is if they're growing on the intake that cools your motor and they block that intake off. And so if you're using your boat, they don't have time to, for the babies, basically plankton in the, in the water to settle onto your motor and grow. It takes weeks up to a month for a plankton uh, stage zebra mussel to grow into an adult zebra mussel. So if you're using your boat regularly over the course of the season, they're not going to have an opportunity to get onto that intake and start growing and start causing issues. Um, the other thing to be aware of is that the lake does kind of have one tool in the toolbox. So most zebra mussels that are exposed by the wintertime drawdown will be killed. So this depends a little bit on temperature and precipitation and the length of the exposure. But the good news is that it might help keep the population a little more manageable in the shallow areas every year. 
years. So that is uh, one bit of good news too. Okay, and I wanted to make sure I expressed um, in this presentation the importance that we don't bring Candlewood zebra mussels anywhere else. So that means whenever you take your boat to another lake, you got to make sure you clean, drain, and dry it. I know we say that all the time, but it's super important. And when you drain it, you have to make sure that includes your bilge, your uh, any ballast water, live wells, any source of water that's on your boat, make sure it's totally empty. Um, like I said, zebra mussels can be plankton and they like to float in that water. Um, when you're washing your hull and your motor thoroughly, ideally use hot water and let it dry in the sun for seven days if possible. That's really how you can best protect any other lakes. Um, we don't want to let Canwood be patient zero for anyone else. Um, on the right, you can see uh, the new signs that were put up um, at the boat launches expressing this info too. So not only do we want zebra mussels not going anywhere else, there's still other invasive species we're concerned about that we don't want uh, here in Canwood. Okay, um, I wanted to reiterate once more before we go to questions um, that zebra mussels have kind of earned this little bit of a mythical reputation, um, but they're a known invasive species that other lakes have been experiencing for many years. Um, they aren't the best new neighbors to have, um, but unfortunately they've decided to move in next door. Um, and there'll be a headache sometimes, um, but Cannawood is absolutely gonna remain the beautiful lake that we love. And as time goes on, they're gonna get used to the neighborhood and they're gonna reach more of an equilibrium um, with the ecosystem um, rather than at the beginning few years when likely they'll have the strongest impact when we're seeing that initial spike in population. So, um, you know, over time, they're gonna move in and settle into the neighborhood um, a little bit more easily. Um, okay, we've got plenty of time for some questions. Um, I wanted to hit some frequently asked ones um, before we go to the chat. Um, so the first and the most common one is whether there's a chemical or a tool um, we can use to get rid of the zebra mussels. Um, and while there are a few that have been tested um, and some have promising results, none of them work 100% of the time. Um, so they always leave zebra mussels before to repopulate. Um, and many have potential negative side effects as well. So that's something to be aware of. So none of those are really good candidates for candlewood. Um, unfortunately, but that leads to drawdown. So what about that? Can that get rid of them all? Um, and unfortunately, the news there is that they can grow and reproduce at a depth that's just impossible for the drawdown to reach. It's too deep. Um, and so that's not an option for Canterwood either. However, it's still going to help manage the population in those shallow areas, like I mentioned. So that'll be interesting to see. Um, and then finally, where did the zebra mussels that we have come from? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I wish I knew for sure. Um, unfortunately, we can't pinpoint definitely. The first was found, like I said, at the tip of Vaughn's neck in the hot spot. The first initial place where we really saw colonies was actually near Kellogg's Point on the western shore of the lake. And both of those areas are generally pretty far from public launches and the pump up station um, where we would think those would be the primary candidates for invasion. So. It's kind of an interesting um, spread pattern, so we can't be totally sure. Um, but that is actually all of the information that I have um, to present, but I wanted to leave some time for questions. Um, so hopefully you've been submitting those to Mark and he can uh, give, me, uh, give me some of those to, to answer. So all right, you have, yes. Okay, <clears throat> um, thanks Neil, let me, uh... I've been trying to jot some of these down and they're all sitting in the chat. So, okay. Um, so one question was why there was such an exponential increase in zebra mussels from the summer slash fall of 23 through into the winter of 24. Yeah, so it's a good question. It follows the pattern that we see in lakes across the country. And basically once zebra mussels reach a, uh, a threshold, where they're able to reproduce, they reproduce really effectively. So females can actually release up to a million eggs a season. So you can see they, they're really good at reproducing. Generally, you see it in the springtime and the fall time. Those are the primary spawning seasons for zebra mussels. But they basically hit a level in 23, 
that allowed them to reproduce exponentially and those offspring were then reproducing and that's why we saw such an increase from this year uh to from last year to this year okay um i'm just trying to combine some some questions here you know so um yeah. A couple of questions were, were centered around um, trying to understand what might eat zebra mussels. Do they have any natural predators or anything along those lines that could be, you know, utilized in Candlewood? Yeah, Safety. so they they do have some some predators. Unfortunately, none of them are effective enough to manage a population. So, you know, there are some predators that um, will eat them, but they won't eat, uh, you know, at a population level. Um, birds will eat them. So when the drawdown um, happens, you'll see seagulls, you'll see ducks going after the zebra mussels and picking them out of uh, shells. Um, and then there are some fish species that will eat them. Um, a couple of goby species, unfortunately, that the lake doesn't have, but they um, don't uh, eat 100% of them, like I mentioned. Um, there are reports that smallmouth bass will eat them. Um, so we may see some of our smallmouth in the lake enjoying zebra mussels, um, but the zebra mussels will uh, kind of win that race. Okay. Um, sort of a question here would be, and it may apply to not, not necessarily just kayaks, um, but if you, if you take a kayak out when it's not in use, um, can they attach when you're kayaking on the lake or for that matter, day boaters? Uh, yeah. General? Um, so it's generally good. Obviously, you don't have to worry about any damage to your kayak if it's just in there for a day. The primary concern is potentially moving them to a different lake. So if you're a day boater who likes to take your kayak into Candlewood or, uh, you know, Lilanona, that sort of thing, the, any lake that has zebra mussels, just give it a hot water spray down afterward and let it fully dry off before you go to a lake that doesn't have zebra mussels. So that would be the only concern. Um, there. So give it a w wipe down, give it a wash, and make sure we're not spreading it. Okay. Um, so there's a few questions coming in about, about uh, wash stations. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, wash stations are, you know, uh, mandatory at places like up at the Adirondacks. Um, somebody was asking if the CLA has changed our policy on boat launch inspections um, since some lakes inspect all boats before launch. So I wonder if you could just touch base a little bit on that and then what we're doing um, with regards to the boat launches. Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, you know, there's no legal requirement in Connecticut um, for folks to um, inspect their boats for invasive species or wash their boat for invasive species before launching in a lake. Um, obviously, that's something that we wish that there was a requirement for that. Obviously, um, ultimately, that would help protect Candlewood and it would have helped protect Candlewood from this situation. So we're working with the state to, you know, get more management at the launches um, whenever we can. Um, and that includes um, possible inspections, people there. Um, what we have done in the meantime is that for the past three years, we started a new program. It's our Lake Steward program. You may have seen the job postings go out for that every year. Um, and those are folks that go to the launches on weekends and holidays during the summertime, and they will inspect boats for invasive species. And they'll also gather some anonymous data from boaters about where the boats are coming from and what species we really need to be concerned about. Um, and we're really proud of that program. Over the past three years, they've inspected over 2,000 boats. Last year, they stopped six invasive species from entering Candlewood Lake. Um, obviously, we wish it was more comprehensive. Um, it's a voluntary program for the boaters, um, but it's it's definitely an educational opportunity for our, our stewards. And that program is gonna run again um, this year. If you're interested in seeing any of that data that they gather uh, anonymous about where folks are coming from, um, that is on our website. So just go to CanwoodLakeAuthority.org and then go to reports and you can see the Lake Steward, all the data, it's all nice and visual and really interesting. So um, that's where we're at right now is we're running that program again and we're trying to get as much coverage uh, as we can. 
Um, hey, Neil, it's an interesting question. So um, somebody asked if uh, you could talk a little bit about the relationship that zebra mussels have to the mineral contents and water chemistry in the lake. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so the primary building block for zebra mussels is actually calcium. Um, they need calcium in the water to, um, to build their shells, basically. And so many years ago, you're talking about 20 years ago now, um, there was a pretty low level of calcium in Candlewood Lake. Um, and it was kind of on the threshold of whether they could actually invade or not. Um, and that may have helped stop them in the past. Um, but over the past 20 years, the calcium levels have increased in the lake. And that's due in part to um, some road salting. That's also due in part to the geology um, in the area. There is calcium in the rocks at the bottom of the lake that's going to enter the lake no matter what we do. Um, so that calcium increased over the past 20 years to a level now where the zebra mussels will have no problem um, populating and reproducing and building their shells. Um, and there's not really an option to remove calcium from uh, a system like Candlewood. So they, uh, they have their building block here that they need and, um, and they will uh, continue to reproduce. Um, there's a question about um, equipment, basically other, other than your, other than your boat, right? So whether it's, uh, you know, some people are asking about things like, you know, say like kayak paddles or vests or, or fishing equipment, yeah. eating, things like that. So um, could you talk just a bit about, about other equipment and if it impacts Yeah, that? so any, so when we're talking about potentially bringing zebra mussels anywhere else, anything that went in the water in Candlewood, wash it, dry it in the sun for long enough that there's basically no remaining Candlewood Lake water on it. Um, and then you're safe to use it anywhere else. But if we're talking about uh, potential damage, um, the only time that zebra mussels can potentially damage property is if it's submerged in the water for a long period of time. So like I was saying, it takes a month for a juvenile to attach and grow into an adult. And so for docks, the sort of thing that you keep in the water for a season, as long as you take it out in the winter time, scrape it off, uh, you're going to be fine. It won't do you any damage. They'll just attach and you'll be able to scrape them off. Uh, no problem. When you need to start being a little bit concerned is if you leave something in year after year, they can accumulate and get heavy. And then they really maybe can start stripping paint. They can cause, you know, it to be really difficult to remove a dock from the lake just from uh, their accumulated weight. So we recommend taking, a, you know, property out of the lake once a year and scraping it off. Um, but to protect any other lakes, give any equipment that is, enters the water in Candlewood a wash and a dry for at least a couple of days in the sun before you use it uh, in a different water body. And Neil, for some people are asking if you uh, are scraping things off um, that are in Candlewood, um, is there a, a recommendation on whether you you know take those out and dispose of them or leave them uh, where they were? And um, whatever's what happens to them? Do they do they just you know anything happen to them? Or is that... Yeah, yeah. So it's a good question. So when you remove something from the lake uh, in the winter time, if you give it about a week almost all of those zebra mussels will have died and they will be easier to scrape off. Their uh, little bissel threads that they use to attach um, will weaken and then they'll be easier to scrape off. So give it about a week, the zebra mussels will die and then you can scrape them off and then whatever's easiest for you. So they can go back into the lake. They're dead at that point. They won't be reproducing. Um, or if it's easier to just scrape them off and put them in a bag and throw them away, they're dead at that point and that's okay too. Um, so a, a few kind of, yeah, a few kind of questions about, um, we're not, we're not getting into a, some people are asking about the status of vegetation. That's a whole different <laughs> topic. Um, but there are some yeah. people asking about, um, any sort of relationships between zebra mussels, um, vegetation, or even grass carp. Is there any sort of, you know, connection with any of those? Um, there's a pretty tenuous connection and if and if anyone ever has any questions that we don't get to tonight um, or it's about a different topic you can always email uh, science at candlewoodlakeauthority.org 
um, or you can give us a call at the number uh, on our website. Um, happy to talk to anyone about any questions that you have um, about the lake. Um, but any uh, connection between the mussels and the plants. Um, I mentioned the one where basically the mussels can make the water clear, which can actually help plants grow uh, to a deeper depth. Um, the other connection is that mussels can and will grow on aquatic plants. So similar to how they'll grow on rocks, uh, docks, that sort of thing. They actually can uh, hook onto a plant like milfoil and uh, will filter feed just riding on that plant for a season too. So um, that's something that we wouldn't necessarily be surprised to see. But any connection, there's no there's no connection to the uh, to the grass carp that are that are in the lake. Um, sorry, I just lost my next question. It was a good one too. Sorry. <laughs> um, oh, I know what it was. I just maybe you can just reiterate. I, I know you touched on this in there, but uh, somebody asked a question. And I think it's just important for everybody to kind of understand. Is basically how long do zebra mussels need to be out of the water in order to uh, to die? Yeah, um, no, it's a good question. So how long do they need to be out of the water to die? Um, like I said, it kind of depends a little bit on temperature. The warmer the temperature, actually, the quicker they'll die um, out of the water. Um, but in the wintertime when it's cold, if they are fully dried out for a week, um, they basically 100% of them uh, will die. So give it a week and you are basically good to go at that point. Um, somebody was asking if zebra mussels would uh, attach to hoists and lifts as well. And can a zebra mussel detach from one item and then reattach to another? Um, so the answer to the first part is yes. Actually, the answer to both parts is yes. But the zebra mussels will attach to hoists and docks. The primary goal of the hoist is to just raise your boat and motor out of the lake. So they're not attaching to your boat um, while they, uh, well, it's, it's just sitting in the water and not in use. So get the boat out of the water and that way they can't foul up the intake. And the muscles growing on the hoist can't really do too much damage. It's just metal um, and it's not gonna cause uh, any problems really. Um, and they can actually get removed from a surface and will reattach somewhere else. It's not something that they often do um, but it is possible um, as long as they're still alive and they detach for whatever reason and they're still in the water, they can kind of drift and find a new place to to hook on to. Um, Neil, I think this is so this question is um, asking if zebra mussels are attracted to something like heat, such as the outdriver exhaust. And I think maybe that's an opportunity to kind of talk a little bit about sort of maybe where to look for them and, and why. Yeah, so. There's no specific attraction to a temperature of water for zebra mussels. Um, what really makes a difference is as they're in their plankton phase, they're kind of drifting around and following the currents. So anywhere that a current will slow down, uh, that's generally where you'll find um, zebra mussels beginning to attach and grow. So, um, you know, nooks. Um, corners, that sort of thing, where water will kind of hit something and stop and change direction. Those plankton villagers will follow the uh, follow the current, and as it stops and is directed a different direction, that zebra mussel uh, villager might say, oh, "Okay, this is a good place for me to stop and settle out and, and attach." And so, any sort of nooks, look at you look at your trim tabs, look at your prop. Those sort of areas on your boat, that's oftentimes where zebra mussels will like to hook on to. Um, and then, you know, when you're talking about shorelines too, where there's an area of high flow, um, zebra mussels will have a harder time growing there as opposed to maybe a cove where water tends to stop and stay generally pretty still. Um, so another question was, asking uh, what can be done about the uh, blue-green algae if it becomes a larger problem as a result of the uh, zebra mussel po population? Um, yeah, that's a good question. And obviously, you know, something that we're concerned about, um, obviously all of our messaging is trying to prevent nutrient pollution to the lake um, all season long. So our message to homeowners is 
green lawn, green lake. If you're adding fertilizer to your lawn, that is fertilizing the algae in the lake, and that includes the blue-green algae. So the first thing that any homeowner can do to help protect the lake from blue-green algae is don't over-fertilize uh, your lawn, uh, especially with phosphorus. Um, and then um, as time goes on um, with the, with the blue-green algae, we're going to keep a very close eye on that situation. And if things are progressing in a way that we don't like, um, we can work with the state um, to think about some solutions. But at this point, I'm optimistic um, that uh, hopefully we won't see a dramatic change. Okay. Um, people are, a few people are wondering about the fish species. Are there any, are there some that are, or which ones are most vulnerable to zebra mussels? Yeah, so, you know, I mentioned the impacts potentially to the food web. There's no sort of fish species that's directly vulnerable to, to zebra mussels. Um, there are some lakes that have seen certain species um, become, you know, to kind of change their behavior, really. Um, what the literature kind of points to is that fish will actually move deeper in a lake uh, that has zebra mussels to kind of go to darker areas um, rather than the more clear water towards the surface. So, you know, the fish species in Candlewood, I suspect, might follow that pattern and go a little bit deeper. Um, but there are plenty of lakes that have really healthy fisheries that also have um, zebra mussels. So the impacts are, are pretty inconsistent. Um. Got a couple questions, Neil, sort of centered around the same thing. Wondering about water movement around your boat, would it help? If, if, have you seen any any uh, literature that talks about, you know, like bubblers or any type of a uh, movement system around docks to uh, help prevent them from um, attaching to a boat? Yeah, I haven't uh, seen anything, whether in practice or, you know, in uh, explanations from other lakes um, where that has been helpful. Um, certainly, it, it couldn't hurt. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily bank on that um, as a solution for uh, for preventing them from uh, getting onto a boat. And it may actually help push some of the villagers onto it if you're perhaps bubbling directly onto your boat. So, um, no, that's not something that I've seen specifically. Um, okay, people are wondering a couple things. If 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 you and this is probably our, I mean we're we're at. 740 now so this might be the last one and, and we can always like neil said you can always send him uh questions or call um mm -hmm. but neil uh questions about the you know, like pressure washing them um one if they can be just pressure washed off and then the other question is you know hot water is not you know an option for a lot of people so does cold water work things like that yeah um well in a pinch um cold water will be just fine it's certainly better than nothing um, the primary thing is the drying. So if you can dry a thing out um, in, the sun, in the sunlight after washing it, um, that is ideal. Um, the other thing to consider is um, it's, we're now at a point where most of the water bodies in the Candlewood watershed have zebra mussels. But if you're washing um, your boat or other equipment that has zebra mussels on it, um, don't necessarily just let it run into storm drains because that storm drain may drain to a water body that is in Candlewood Lake and we wouldn't want, necessarily want to um, spread Candlewood zebra mussels just via the stormwater infrastructure. So try to capture um, as much of that water as you can or do it over grass, um, that sort of thing. But uh, a power washer should get them off just fine um, and cold water is better than no water. Okay. All right. Um, well, there are, are, are a lot of questions here. Um, thank you so much to everybody who sent questions in and everybody who's in attendance here. Um, like we said, Neil, you can send uh, messages to Neil if you'd like to email or call. Um, we'll be happy to follow up with people uh, later on as well. Um, and we really appreciate the great turnout tonight. And thank you, Neil. Yeah, thank yeah. you, everyone. And like I said, give our office a call or email science at CandlewoodLakeAuthority.org, um, or you can message our Facebook and we can take a look at that too. So always to reach us. And um, thanks, everyone, for attending. And um, I hope this was uh, informative. So thanks, everyone.